2 Chronicles 7. I'm going to read verses 11 through 14. So if you've got your copy of God's Word digitally or physically, would you uh, flip or turn there with me? I guess that's the same thing. Flip or scroll there. There it is. <laughs> with me. Or if you don't, you can join me here on the screen. 2 Chronicles 7, 11 through 14. And would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? Verse 11. It says this. When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and had succeeded in carrying out all he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his own palace, the Lord appeared to him at night and said, I've heard your prayer and I've chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Come on, let's pray. Father, we're grateful, we're thankful for this moment. Thank you for this day this time, this space that you have set aside, that you have ordained for us to be here. Maybe we're here by of an invitation, or maybe this was just something that was good to do. Lord, whatever, it was a tool that you used. God, you actually are intentional with this moment. So we're not just here because of an invitation. We're not just here because we had time on the schedule. We are here because you ordained this moment. And because that is true, Lord, that means you have something special and unique to speak to each and every one of us at the same time. So Lord, help us to focus. Help us to hear what you have to say. Lord, help me to get out of the way. And any words of mine, may they fall flat, but may only your words, Lord, penetrate our hearts for transformation. So Lord, as your service servants in this room, this is what we say. Speak, Lord, because we're listening. In Jesus' name, everybody said, come on, come on, everybody said, Amen, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. So, I'm going to jump right into it, family. Reading this verse, 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14, we see it kick off saying this, if my people. But then as we continue to read, we see it say this, then I will hear from heaven. That right there is what theologians call a conditional statement. And there are several conditional statements throughout Scripture. It's where God says, if this occurs, then this will happen. And not all of these statements are explicit, but some of them are rather implied. You can look at Matthew 17, verse 20. It says, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, here it is, then you may say to this mountain, remove from here to over there, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Look at Romans 10, 9. It says this, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, here it is again, then you will be saved. It's a if statement. It's a conditional statement. It's based on a condition being met. If you do this, then this will happen. And there are over 1,600 or at least 1,600 if-then conditions that the Bible gives us from the Old Testament and Genesis throughout the New Testament to Revelation. And so today in our nation, or I'll say it this way first, in, in this particular text, there was a peculiar time for Israel. And not too indifferent from what we're experiencing in our nation today, where our nation is hurting. Our nation is broken, and we're standing in an if-then moment. The Lord is saying, if you as a nation, and when I say nation, I'm not so much focused on the United States. If we were in some other country, we could preach the same thing. So this is not an America-focused message. Are you tracking with me today? But it's a if-then moment that we're standing in, and God has given us the path to healing. But can I tell you, it comes with terms and conditions, which is the title of today's message, Terms and Conditions. Can you turn to your neighbor and tell them terms and conditions? 
Now look at your other neighbor and say, get your iPhone out and say yes to those terms and conditions. Say yes to the terms and conditions. <laughs> I heard that. So right here in our text, as I mentioned a moment ago, family, Israel finds itself in a peculiar place. There's been a lot happening, right? David, as king, has, has passed on, and, and Absalom, even in that whole time, tried to uh, overtake the, the, the throne. And, and even before, even between uh, David and Solomon, there was another dust up. And so finally, Solomon, he is king, but the nation finds itself in a peculiar place. The nation finds itself having experienced a lot. And so what God is doing right here, he is giving a blueprint for how to fix it. He's giving a get well plan, if you will. And he lays out this conditional statement beginning with if. And this condition of if, if we kind of slow down and peel back a little bit, we see the truth of, of this reality that following Jesus is based off of our response. Because if you're saying if, it means if we respond the right way, then such will happen. And so much of following Jesus is like that. It's off of our response. What's our response to his word? What's our response to his call? What's our response to his will? What's our response to his grace? What's our response to his mercy? What's our response by what he did by sending his son, Jesus, is based off of a response. Are you tracking with me today? So much of following Jesus is based on our response. And so while there once was this question, what will Jesus do? We've got to get rid of that question and ask a better question, what will I do? Because we already know what Jesus has done. He said it is finished. So he did everything that there was to do. It's finished. And he'll come back and he'll put a stamp on it, but it is done. And so the question is no longer what will Jesus do, but it's what will I do? In other words, how will I respond to what he has done? It's the terms and conditions. And so today, as we navigate this if-then moment here in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, we're going to discover the terms and conditions for change. And so we're going to hang right here with verse 14. And so let's look at it real quickly. It says this, if my people who are called by my name, and here it is, will humble themselves. That leads us to our first observation today. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. You know, oftentimes, family, we get in our own way. We get in our own way by choosing our way instead of God's way. But here's what prayer gives us an opportunity to do. Prayer gives us an opportunity to do things differently through humility. Prayer is an opportunity to humble ourselves. And admit this, we don't know what we're doing. I'll raise my hand first. So prayer gives us that opportunity to say, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know it all. I don't know what I don't know. So I'm going to humble myself in this moment to hear from heaven, to receive from on high divine power and intervention from heaven. Prayer is an opportunity to step into humility because the reality is many of us in here today, family, we live as if we are the master of our own show. We act like we are the ones to determine this thing. We are the ones to direct this thing. We are the ones to align up everything how it should go. We have our vision board. Nothing's wrong with it. Do it. But we say it's going to be this, and it's going to be this, and it's going to be this. But did God tell you that? So we, prayer gives us an opportunity to say, Lord, what do you have to say? Lord, what do you feel about this? Because the reality is, I'll say it this way. How often do we ask God to bless a decision that we never consulted him on? So we made the plans. But what happened is, family, we didn't inform, excuse me, we didn't consult God. We informed him. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's the job I'm going to take. Here's the person I will marry. Here's what I won't do. Here's what I will do. 
And then we find ourselves at the place of asking God to bless it. And then we wonder why, family, why is this job so stressful? Why are we constantly arguing and we can't seem to get on the same page? Why are the kids saying, well, well, where's daddy or where's mommy or why this or why that? It's because uh, have we made decisions that we've never consulted God on? And then on the back end, we ask him to bless it. Now, praise God that his grace is sufficient and he covers us. But I wonder, I just wonder if we don't have to get in that space from the beginning if we first say, Lord, what do you have to say about this? Because the reality is many of us are good at informing God on what we're going to do, but we're terrible at consulting him on what we should do. So what if we slow down for a moment and say, Lord, what do you have to say about this? Look what James says. They have brother Jesus. He says this. Now listen. You who say today or tomorrow we will go to do this or that, uh, to that city or spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will and we will live and do this or that. What does it mean? It's simply to say, Lord, what do you have to say about this? is consulting him instead of informing him. And can I tell you, family, we can do this at the lowest level, that when you get up in the morning, Lord, what should I wear today? Can I tell you, he'll talk to you about that. Lord, where should I go to lunch today? What should, what, what should I do today? And he wants to be invited into those moments. Here's what it points to. It points to this, humility. And humility makes room for us to decrease and God to increase. It says, Lord, let me get out of the way so you can fill all of this space, so you can do what only you can do. It's not about me. It's not about my desires. And some people say, well, that scripture says, well, you know, the Lord will give you the desires of his heart as we delight ourselves in him. No, no, no. As we delight ourselves in the Lord, can I tell you what that means? It means that our desires will mimic, will look like his desires because we have delighted ourselves in him. So in other words, what is that? That's giving him way. That's allowing ourselves to decrease so that he may increase. It's what John talks about. He must increase, but I must decrease. So let me get out of the way. Let me gain a perspective to see the magnitude of who God is. Humility allows for my view of the greatness of God to come into proper perspective. Humility allows for my view of the greatness of God to come into proper perspective. That as I humble myself and realize I'm not the master of my own life, I can see the perspective of who God is and all of what he wants to do in my life. Are y'all tracking with me this morning? So the process of God healing us, it begins with humility and it's recognizing our need to him. But that's not all that we discover in, of the terms of conditions here in verse 14. Look what else it says. It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, and here it is, pray. Here's the second observation, pray. So if humility allows us to recognize that we need him, here's what prayer does. Prayer is the channel in which we access him. And can I tell you, for the believer, prayer is vital. Prayer is essential because prayer is that that place, that channel where you can release your heart, release your thoughts to God, and in the process, capture his. So prayer is that place when you're sitting in that doctor's office and you hear what the doctor said, you can take that, you can release that to the Lord, then capture what heaven has to say about it. So, oh, that's his report, but he ain't heard my report yet. Prayer is that place where your marriage may be in struggling. It may be struggling, but you can go and you can release that to the Lord. And now you get to hear what heaven has to say about your prayer. Oh, excuse me, about your marriage. Prayer is that place where you can go to the Lord and you can release what is happening in your family with your children. And then you can hear what heaven has to say. So if we have, have kept that channel closed, family, then we are living without what is vital. 
the voice of the Father. We need the, so we can't, we don't just sing the songs about what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit reveals the heart of the Father. So let's keep the channel open through a consistent prayer life. And Jesus shows us, he modeled that out. Here he is, he's God with skin on. But yet, he did not dismiss the importance of prayer. Look at Mark 1, verse 35. It says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. So here he is, fully God, fully man. Fully God, fully man. And he had to be that way so he could experience everything that we would experience and show us a way to live. So he experienced it. He felt it. And he did what he did from his humanity. Because Philippians 2 talked about how he humbled himself so that he could be our great example. And through that, God exalted him. But here it is. It's showing us a consistent prayer life. So who are we to think, family, that we can skip prayer when Jesus, God himself, did not skip prayer? We got to step back and we got to analyze that. Like, oh, wait a minute. What am I missing? That I'm on the go. I got to get up. I got to get to it. But yeah, not before you pray. Not before you allow that access from that channel to happen to receive divine intervention uh, from on high. Because that's how you know how to approach that meeting at 2 o'clock. That's how you know how to respond to that phone call that you know you have to take. That's how you can have the right attitude when that team sound goes off on your laptop. Come on now. It's your pray first. <laughs> Paul highlights the necessity of prayer. Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. So Paul says, look, don't be anxious about anything, but in every, there's nothing too small that you can't pray about. I think some of us, we hesitate to pray because we're like, but this is so insignificant. Can I tell you, the Lord is in the details and he cares about what you may feel is insignificant. He wants to speak to that. You know why? Because it shows him that you're choosing him. It shows him that, that you have, that he has your attention. So he's in the details. He's into those moments. They say the devil's in the details. Not God is in the details. And so no matter how small it is or minute you feel that it is, he says, Talk to me about it because I have something to say to it. But so often, family, we find ourselves talking about the issue instead of praying about the issue. It's, it's not enough just to talk about it. We'll find anyone who listens and we'll just talk about it. But can I tell you, family, don't just talk about the struggles in your marriage. Pray about it. Don't just talk about the healing you need in your body. Pray about it. Don't just talk about what you're believing God to do. Pray about it. Because can I tell you, he hears those prayers. And here's another thing about prayer. Prayer does not have an expiration date. So you prayed it 20 years ago. You hadn't seen it come to pass yet. Who told you to give up on that prayer? Who told you that God didn't hear you? No, he heard that prayer. It doesn't expire. But we got to have the confidence to know that the word of God will not return to him void. And so as we pray, as we seek his will, as we seek his way, we got to trust that he will do what he said he will do. There are people in this room who have and are experiencing the miraculous in their life because there was a consistency of prayer and faith that they believe that God will hear them and answer that prayer. And he has. So don't think that prayers have an expiration date. Because the reality is, many of, many of us are here in this moment because there were some grandmothers that prayed for us. There were some grandfathers that prayed for us. There were some mothers that prayed for us. There were some fathers that prayed for us. And if your parents were like my parents, I grew up in church and I'll be sleeping in the middle of the night and I wake up, what is this Crisco on my forehead? And I wondered about how crazy it was then, but now I see what the Lord is doing today, and I say, thank the Lord for the prayers of my mother. Thank the Lord for the prayers of my father. I didn't want what they were saying then, but I'm so thankful to be walking in what they pray for today. So parents, take that as a lesson. Pray for your children. Don't give up on them. The what you see today doesn't mean how it's going to be tomorrow. 
You don't have to accept what they say and, well, they a little this and they a little that and they a little this. They didn't design them, so they can't define them. The only one who can bring definition to their life is God on high. So we have to go to heaven and pray for our sons and our daughters. Pray for our children. Pray for our marriage to hear what heaven has to say. And then Paul says, 1 Thessalonians, he says, pray without ceasing. You may say, Paul, that's a lot, brother. I don't know how y'all did it back then, but we got to go to work. Those bills won't pay themselves. They say you got to work out, longevity, got to keep going. I got responsibilities. How, how can I just pray without ceasing? It's not about 24-7 hour prayer. It's about a mindset. It's about a lifestyle. It's about a consistency. It's about an awareness. You know, you can get so practical with this. You can do, I, I've mentioned this before, these one-minute prayers, these 30-second prayers, even before you leave in the morning. Maybe it's like, Lord, I thank you that you're with us today. Protect us on our going. Protect us as we're out and we're traveling and school and work and all the different places that our family would be. Would you cover us with your grace? In Jesus' name. One minute. You get to the office, you do the whole email thing. Lord, I thank you that I didn't lose my mind reading these emails. Thank you for your faithfulness. Because if I have to say, per my previous email, one more time. Right? <laughs> your lunch break, right? You, there, there are moments throughout the day, 30-second prayers, one-minute one prayers. And what's happening is Building that consistency is developing that lifestyle to where your first response is what? To pray first now, not to just simply talk about it. And we named it talk about it because, yeah, we're, we're talking about it with everyone else except for him. So now let's reframe that. So now we're going to talk about it to the Father. Now, from a super save and my religious folks, you said, that ain't tarrying. Nope. That is not what it means to tarry. Some one-minute prayers. Yeah, you can have extended time of prayer, of course. But family, it's, it's, in the de it's in these details, in the moments. It's just in the consistency of prayer that I'm, I'm always giving God priority and I'm giving him way. Are y'all tracking with me today? So here's the last one. And Micah, if you come help me land this plane, here's our last observation. So he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and here it is, and seek my face. That's our last observation. Seek my face. When you read Seek My Face, you may have this question, which is a reasonable one to ask. How do I seek God's face? What does that even mean? What does that, what does that look like? Well, family, this, this statement of this phrase of seek my face is it's not about looking for a a physical, visible face of God, but what it means in the Hebrew language here in the Old Testament, it means this. It means presence, and it means favor. And so when you see face throughout the Old Testament, this is what it's talking about, God's presence and his favor. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. It's for his presence to be with you. It's for his favor to be upon you. So when he is saying here to Israel, and ultimately we can peer into this and see that for our lives, he is saying part of this condition is that you seek my face, is that you seek my presence. How do we do that? We do that through worship. But family, before I go there, it's important that we heed, take heed to this. Because the very fact that the Lord is saying, seek my face, means that at some point we were, but then we turned off from it. At some point, we were like, Lord, I need your presence, your favor. But at some point, we removed our gaze. And I think about Peter in Matthew 14, where here he is. He's walking on water as he's focused on Jesus. He's walking on water. But we know the story. He only began to sink when his gaze shifted. And he took his eyes off of Jesus. So what has shifted our gaze? What has gotten our attention? What has caused our attention to get off of Jesus? And, and maybe that's the reason why we feel like we're sinking in life. Because where our gaze was once on him, we now find it on everything else. 
But he is saying, seek my face. Seek my presence. Seek my favor. Seek who I am. Because a face of a person, it reveals their character and nature. You, could, you, ever, you ever told somebody, your child or cousin, these nephew, fix your face? Because their face was off tells you something was going on on the inside. So seeking God's face, it, it gives us inside look to his character, his nature, which is grace, which is love, which is mercy, which is forgiveness, which is his faithfulness. But what has stolen our attention? And can I say this, family? You may have to slide your feet back on this one, okay? The outlets and things are telling us that a Tuesday in November is, is, is very significant time in history, and it's very vital. And here's my response to that. There was, I think, the most vital and significant time in history. They've actually missed the date. It was over 2,000 years ago. The moment where Jesus says it is finished, the moment where Jesus fooled the devil who thought he won and he got up out of that grave. That was the most significant time in history. So can I tell you, if we are looking at a Tuesday in November, you say, why are you going political? I'm not going political. I'm reminding Christians, if you're a Christian in here, of where our gaze is supposed to be focused on. And so if we're focused on a Tuesday in November, thinking that will determine the direction of your life based on the outcome of that day, can I tell you, our gaze have shifted off of Jesus. Now, I know that may feel like some harsh things to say, but we have to analyze what we're saying. If we're saying that, we have to analyze what we're actually saying. We're saying depending on whoever takes a position in an office will dictate the direction and the destiny of my life. So you know what it makes us ask? Is God God? Is he who he say that he is? Do I really believe this or I believe an idea of this? But ultimately, I'm putting my faith in something else to feel comfortable. But the reality is, if he is the king of kings, if he is the Lord of lords, it is irrelevant than what takes place on a Tuesday in November. Because the reality is, what God has called you to, who he's called you to be, how's he, how he has called you to express that to the world, will happen no matter who takes place on Inauguration Day in January 2025. Now, there could be a lot of silence around that because we're pondering that, because we're answering that question. But family, that's what we have to ask ourselves. Where is my gaze? Maybe it's not politics. Maybe it's the job that you have. Maybe that's the thing that has defined your life. Maybe there's talks and rumblings of changes around the company. Now you're starting to feel some type of way and question, who are you? Who have you been this whole time? Can I tell you, it was never the job that defined you. Or maybe you're a parent in here and you find yourself at a transitional moment of your life because you're getting to the point where the nest is becoming empty. And it's forcing you to ask questions that you hadn't asked in 18 years being reminded of who you are and where your gaze has to be. David points to this in Psalms 27, 3, where he says, one thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And here it is, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire of him or to worship him, to surrender to him in his temple. And here it is, David, all that his life was, defeating Goliath, the kingship, all of this thing. And he's saying, the one thing I ask, the thing that I desire, that I seek the most, is to experience God's presence, to have my life transformed, and to worship the Father. He's showing us what it's about. Not that those other things weren't significant, they didn't matter, but it's where is my gaze? And can I tell you, I love that David even tells us this. Because the Lord says this about David. He says, he's a man after my own heart. 
But as you discover that, David didn't say this about himself. No one else said that about David. It was God who said that about David. When you look at David's life, he has some mishaps. Nathan called him out. You know what you did? But it was a repentant heart that he was willing to say, Lord, create in me a clean heart, renew a right spirit within me. Because at the end of the day, it's, it's your face, it's your presence that I seek, that I desire. And so I say that to say, I don't know what your journey has been. And maybe you're sitting here and you're like, yo, I've made too many mistakes. How can I? He's like, no, don't even worry about that. It's the willingness and the position of your heart to say, I'm turning from that and I want to seek you. And he says, come on. And he invites us into this life.